The coronavirus outbreak has caused panic around the world. Cities are in lockdown, stock markets have tumbled, and the basics, including masks, even toilet paper, are running out. So, how should we deal with the anxiety? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Mariam Namazi. As the coronavirus spreads around the world, so is the fear and anxiety, despite scientists telling people not to panic. Many countries have suspended schools, public events and imposed travel restrictions. South Korea has the second highest number of cases after China, where the outbreak began two months ago. It's suspending a visa-free program with Japan in response to Tokyo imposing quarantine measures on South Korean visitors. Other countries are denying entry altogether to visitors from high-risk regions or are putting them into quarantine. Well, this goes against guidelines from the World Health Organization, which says these measures are not always effective. Well, the global outbreak is hitting businesses hard as well. Chinese exports fell by 17.2% in the year to January. Factories are closed in the world's second largest economy, affecting global supply chains. Share markets from New York to Hong Kong fell by up to 3% this week. And an airline trading group says the industry could lose $113 billion this year. I just want one pack. No, not one pack. And the panic has caused a run on supermarkets in places like Australia. Police in Sydney were called in to stop shoppers fighting over toilet paper. Shelves have been stripped bare of canned foods, milk and hand sanitizer. People fear they'll run out of supplies if they're forced into quarantine. South Korea has now restricted the sale of masks to two packs a person a week. It's difficult to go without a mask. Living without masks is no longer the norm. When I'm not wearing one, I feel worried. This is the first time I queued for a mask. I passed by here several times, but they didn't have any. For us, it's not easy to make ends meet. We're on the verge of bankruptcy. So let's bring in our panel then. Here in the studio, we have Dr. Anthony Renshaw, Medical Director in Northern Europe for International SOS, a health and travel security risk services company. Philip Pellegrin, a financial analyst and economist. And then also joining us on Skype from Hay on Wye in Wales in the UK, Burton Paul, a healthcare engagement specialist. Very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us on Inside Story. Anthony Redshaw, let me begin with you. We've seen this virus now spread across 60 countries on six continents in the space of nine or 10 weeks. How would you describe the way it's making people feel and behave? Have you seen anything like this before? No, I think the scenario is fairly unique. We know that um, epidemics can trigger a cycle of, uh, of hysteria and complacency and uh, anywhere in between. And I think um, what we've seen here uh, is uh, somewhat um, predictable, given the tremendous disruption that we're seeing uh, from the travel um, disruptions, uh, and plus the fact that um, the, the, the virus uh, has had some health impacts uh, in a number of different countries, not just physical, but psychological impacts. A lot of people are very stressed about the situation. And finally, it's also having a, an impact on business continuity. And a lot of organisations in particular are realising that really now is the time to think about uh, and act upon uh, the threat of infectious disease on their business. It's interesting that you say the reaction to all of this is somewhat predictable. Burton Paul, if I can come to you, is the fear and anxiety justified when actually the fatality rate with this disease is very low and there have also been thousands of people who have managed to recover from it since the outbreak began? I mean, clearly not. You know, it's uh, the, the the difference is that the last time something like this happened in 2012 with MERS, for example, you know, social media was nothing what it is today. Even though, you know, so for example, Facebook users doubled from one billion to two plus billion um, in the space of ten, eight years. 
it's different today. You know, social media is 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 so prevalent in the sense that this panic buying. So those the the video that 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 that's happened in Australia has been shared and all over social media, and that just generates panic and just it, it instills panic across the board because people keep sharing it, and people keep sharing it, and that's how it's happened. This is what's different today, and that's what's fueling all this panic, in my opinion. Yeah, but let me just follow up on that because most of those who've died were either elderly or they had other ailments that compromised their immune system. So when you look at the facts and the reality of the illness, despite what you say about social media, it, the panic isn't warranted, is it, if you, if you don't fall into either of those two categories? No, that's true. But just because you don't fall into those two categories doesn't mean you have somebody you love that falls into that category. Um, you know, so if you look at it, depending on what platform of social media you use or, or what platform of digital engagement you use, uh, the the sweet spot of of an age group is is you know around late thirties or mid thirties to to later mid forties, where you have elderly parents and then you also have children, and those are the two most vulnerable categories. And you're going to be concerned for those, not just your yourself and your, your spouse, but it's those two spectrums that you're going to be concerned about. So that's why it, that's the ongoing as well uh, effects that's happening with social media and the panic. Philip, so perhaps social media is magnifying an existing level of fear and anxiety over this. Talk to me about what's happening in the market, because perhaps that turbulence is uh, exacerbating a sense of crisis over this. What do investors fear and what are the markets telling us? Well, I think that we're heading towards a uh, recession. Uh, we're heading towards recession first because of the disruption that there's been to supply chains, uh, increasingly to production and spending, with the exception of, of panic buying. And, as you mentioned, a disruption to markets uh, with the S&P 500 down by roughly 10%, with US companies no longer able to uh, issue uh, debt. And increasingly, uh, smaller companies going to run into cash flow problems. Uh, and I think... On top of that, you have the uncertainty. Nobody knows how bad it's going to get. And in those circumstances, what, which business wants to invest and which consumer wants to go out and make a big ticket purchase? And all of that basically means that um, uh, we're heading towards a recession, I fear. Uh, so, Anthony Renshaw, does that fear and anxiety in the markets then simply reflect how people feel about how deadly and widespread this virus is going to be and then also how much disruption it's going to cause to their lives? Um, look, I think people are doing what they think is best um, in terms of their health behaviours. Um, the individuals are realising that they have a, a responsibility to protect the health of them, themselves and their families, those around them. Uh, governments are uh, realising that they have a big role to play uh, and increasingly employers are realising what an impact um, this is going to have, and so they can also influence what's going to happen. It's fast enough, though. Governments are, are, have a role to play, so clear and effective communication is key right now. Uh, companies have to come up with a policy for sick pay and to, to make sure that certain rules are established, and that's made, being made clear. But is perhaps a sense of panic come from, coming from the fact that both governments and companies might be woefully unprepared for something like this? Mm. Look, I think organisations and governments are doing the best they can in very unpredictable and very uncertain times. There's a lot still that we don't know about this virus, but increasingly as more research is done uh, on the virus, we are actually building quite a good picture of how this virus is behaving, and there are more and more excellent resources now available to guide governments and guide businesses on what they should and shouldn't be do doing. Is that getting through to people, though? Um, I, I think in, a, in many countries it is. There are a number of uh, countries that are doing very um, um, persuasive public health messaging. Uh, we've seen the example of Singapore, for example, with its excellent health messaging to the population. But Singapore is a gold standard example, many have said, in the way they've dealt with this. But, what, Philip, what are your thoughts on what Anthony has just said? Do you, I mean, if messaging is so effective, then I mean, why are people freaking out and, and panic buying? Well, I think part of the problem is that the global economy was already uh, quite weak uh, and fragile. Uh, it was weakened by uh, the trade war between the US and China and the threat that that might um, uh, resume. Uh, it's fragile because of the huge amount of uh, debt uh, that there is uh, across um, uh, the economy. And then we've seen, you know, the US Federal Reserve 
riding to the rescue uh, this week with an exceptional half-point interest rate cut. Uh, and markets, instead of um, you know, rallying as they might have, might, might have expected them to do, uh, actually have ended uh, the week uh, down. But is and that because that, and, the, and there's a the, feeling and, that interest rate cuts are just not the adequate policy response to something like this? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if you're a central banker, you want to you know, reassure people that you carry uh, a big bazooka, and in this case, you're firing blanks. I mean, what use really uh, is a, a rate cut in spurring someone who's uh, afraid to go to work or afraid to go out uh, and travel and spend? You know, the fact that it's slightly cheaper to borrow uh, is not uh, going to get you to, to change your behaviour. So, Bert and Paul, what are your thoughts on that? The sort of policy responses we saw during the 2008 financial crisis, they're not adequate, they're not working now. It, it, tell us more about what governments should be doing then. You know, I, I think that uh, so when you mentioned Singapore, that is the gold standard. Um, you know, the UK, they've only recently put an action plan. It's a 30 page document. Uh, I think they should simplify. I think should, there should be better communication to the public to alleviate this panic or to stop the panic from happening. I don't think there's enough communication. It hasn't been consistent. The messaging hasn't been consistent. The World Health Organization, you know, they are the gold standard in terms of what information we get. I think what people don't realize is that you have access as, as, as a public user, you've got access to all the latest and the most credible sources of information on this on this disease, um, on this on this infection that's happening right now, and that's through the World Health Organization, the ECDC, European Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, the Center for the, the U.S. version of that. But but and Burton have, Paul, you you were just telling me about social media ex deepening perhaps a sense of crisis among people. There's a plethora of information out there, but do people know where to go for the right information? Or, you know, is there perhaps a lot of inaccurate information that is feeding into a sense of panic? That's exactly the point. People don't know. That, that's what you know, sparked the idea for me to write the book years ago. It, people don't realize where the credible sources of information are. So they will be, be jumping onto anything they can. So, for example, Facebook and Twitter have, have cracked down on all these fake cures, fake prevention methods and all that stuff. You know, Google has, has made sure that now when you type in coronavirus, the most credible sources of information, like the World Health Organization page, will pop up as one of your first entries. So it's things like that. People don't realize where the credible sources are and what to believe and what not to believe and how to decipher what's credible and what's not credible. So, yeah, and there's this inherent... Anthony Renshaw, there's a great deal of information to mm -hmm. sort through, but uh, the facts and the reality of this illness are out there and they are accessible to people, and yet mm -hmm. is the sense of panic a sign of a sort of information void? I think with any crisis, um, there's an element of anxiety and there has to be a source of an anxiety. Now there's clearly a source of anxiety here, but how we deal with that anxiety um, me, is, is how we can get around um, our, our, um, uh, our crisis response. And, and, and the, the way we deal with that is to fix the, the sources of uncertainty. Now we know for a fact there's a number of different pieces of information on how we transmit the disease. We know how we can prevent transmitting the disease to others. And we also know that there are certain measures that governments will take at certain stages within uh, an outbreak to try and contain the disease or to try and mitigate the containment isn't the working, is it? That's part of the problem. And there's certainly uh, evidence that there are some containment that's uh, been um, being done in China, for example, that, that actually has had quite a tremendous impact. Um, and so I think... China's we... quite a unique example because they're in a position to take measures that we're unlikely to see replicated in other parts of the world. Well, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think every country is different. Um, the response will de depend on what is practical in that country and what is thought to be most effective in that country. And societies work differently. There are collectivist societies, there are individualistic societies, and that's OK. Uh, in previous outbreak responses, there has been a shift, uh, differences in between uh, governments and how they've dealt with um, outbreaks. That is not in itself something to be concerned about. What we all need to understand is why are we doing these containment efforts in the first place? And that's to do with what the virus is all about. It's quite unique in that it has a, quite a long incubation period, which means that all of these containment measures that we are now concerned about actually make perfect logical public health sense uh, at the right time. 
Uh, so once we understand that... Bert and Paul, what, obviously governments are going through a process right now and maybe they're trying to formulate a policy over this, but uh, it seems as though they have to now move beyond the policy of containment more to, to mitigation and to response and particularly to diagnostic testing. And in first world Western countries, uh, we have seen that the, the rollout of diagnostic testing is just far too slow. But the thing is, right, is, is that there is this there's this uncertainty. There is this unknown factor. We don't know enough about this virus. Our leading medical specialists in the world don't know enough about this virus. So there is this anxiety. But, you know, historically within society, what happens is that when we don't know something and we're afraid of something that's going to affect us and our loved ones, we turn to the leaders of the country. So I think, you know, one of the most important things to calm this panic is going to come from the leaders. It's not just about putting out an action plan. It's a communication package. You have to calm the public down. And that's going to come from leadership. And that's going to come across the board. And when you, uh, Philip, when you look at pictures coming to us from, well, Australia and even here in the UK of panic buying, it doesn't seem as though the mood is a calm one necessarily. Uh, how do you how do you make sense of this anxiety, the impact of panic buying on society? Uh, you know, how, what, what is driving this type of spending? I think, you know, panic buying is rational if everyone else is doing it. Obviously, the optimal solution would be for everyone not to panic buy. But if you... But, uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes, exactly. You want to get there first. I think one factor is that we live in an age of, of, of populist politicians, people like... Donald Trump, who are good at shouting and making noise, but not very good at governing. And what we need uh, is actually experts and technocrats, all these maligned people, um, uh, who actually uh, can get things done um, uh, and uh, can put in place the measures that are needed uh, to restore Do you feel confidence. as though the experts are getting enough of a platform? Well, I mean, certainly there's been a return of medical experts. People are listening um, uh, to them more. But if you look at, for example, public health in the United States, it's cruelly uh, underfunded. Uh, that said, you know, around the world, there are things that governments can do um, to lessen the economic impact. Uh, for example, central banks can provide um, a funding uh, to banks so that they can... Uh, extend uh, loans uh, to companies that are facing a cash crisis. You know, they can offer... Governments can offer tax rebates or tax uh, deferrals. Uh, and, you know, you can offer, as the UK is doing, uh, sick pay so that people who are off uh, sick or who are afraid to go to work uh, don't lose money so, as a result. So, Anthony Renshaw, if governments were perhaps more proactive, if uh, the policy was, response was clearer on stimulus measures, on ways of uh, preventing permanent or at least long-term economic damage on things like sick pay, uh, perhaps that would that would calm people's agitation. Perhaps it would, but I think what we're forgetting here is the, is the key role of employers. And, and that's what we're seeing more and more. Um, more and more um, of our clients are calling for specific advice, um, really for, for travel guidance, because we know for a start um, just how disruptive this has been. This has been the most disruptive crisis that we've certainly been uh, involved with uh, for many years. Um, the second thing is providing support to employees in, in the field, you know, in terms of uh, uh, very rapid access to information, accurate information, emotional support uh, and, and guidance on what to do. What do we do if we have a case in the workplace? What do we do if somebody is quarantined? There's a lot of work going on in multiple companies now on, on those issues and many others. OK, so, uh, the, right, Burton Paul, let me come to you then, just touching on some of what Anthony was saying there about uh, the response and the handling of this going forward, particularly as more and more infections come up, which is, uh, which is what is expected to happen. How can you prepare for the worst-case scenario without making the panic worse? You know, uh, OK, so when you, when, if you, the, the problem with relying on medical experts at this point is, is the uncertainty. They don't know. So I think it's a question of, of alleviating the fears from a higher-up leadership. We, as, as a population, elected our leaders. We elected them. We put trust in them. At this point, we, the society, it, 
converts us into almost like children where we look up to our parents to guide us in this situation. So I think it really stems from the leaders of all countries. And it's about formulating a solid and convincing action plan. You know, what are, so if you go to the, the gov.uk gov website, there is an action plan. It's a 30 page document. Let's simplify it. Let's put out the message. Let's calm people down and let's tell them that this is what we're doing. This is how we're preparing now. This is our our, our, our plan B, just in case if it gets any worse. It's about simplifying the message, about simplifying that, that calming fears. How important is it uh, in terms of the, you said that a recession is probably a foregone conclusion, but what can uh, governments, policymakers do at this point to uh, perhaps mitigate the economic damage from this? Well, as I say, I think that, uh, yes, the way we are heading towards um, a recession, uh, and it doesn't really matter whether the panic is justified or not, if, if people stop going to work and people stop spending, then a recession uh, ensues. Uh, I think uh, governments uh, first uh, need to be uh, much more proactive in terms of actually tackling um, uh, the, the health emergency, but on a more direct economic front, uh, not rely so much on monetary policy, um, which is not effective, uh, but prepare the, the targeted uh, fiscal measures uh, which are needed um, uh, and provide reassurance that, you know, if companies or indeed individuals are going to go through difficult times, uh, that they will step in. So, for example, you know, if you're self-employed, uh, you might not benefit from sick pay. What are you going to do? You know, for example, if you deliver food, um, and lots of people do that now uh, in advanced economies, um, and uh, you feel a bit ill, are, are you going to stay at home? Maybe not, and in which case you'd be spreading the disease, so you need to provide reassurance. Now, I think the, the, the really big challenge is that up until now, this has been mostly an advanced economy um, uh, disease. If it starts uh, spreading uh, extensively uh, in developing countries, they lack uh, the capacity and indeed uh, the funds um, uh, to do uh, much about this, uh, and I think that is uh, very worrying indeed. Right. So, yes, obviously there's concern about how uh, healthcare systems in developing countries, which are already dealing with a number of problems and challenges, are likely to cope. Um, we've spoken a great deal in this programme about the, the long-term economic, social, political, uh, damaging consequences of something like this. But can I perhaps get uh, a final thought from each of you on uh, something positive that could emerge from this, uh, perhaps in terms of uh, solidarity, resilience. Anthony, you first. Yes, yeah, so I think we're seeing evidence of that right now, actually. Um, there are a number of societies that have come together quite successfully. We mentioned a couple of them today. Uh, and I think they have benefited from that as a society. And we often do see that within epidemics. We saw that during the, uh, the big flu pandemic of 1918. Um, but the, the most important uh, benefit I would see is the, the progress that the scientific community has made since um, the lessons of SARS um, uh, in 2002. Um, there is now uh, ready sharing of information. Data is um, shared between uh, journals. Uh, it is shared uh, immediately. Uh, there is no, none of those blockages that we used to have in the past, which means that uh, whenever there is a new discovery, it is immediately uh, available, open access for everybody. Well, so, to Bert use. and Paul, let me get your thoughts on that. Something uh, unexpected, surprising, positive that could possibly emerge from uh, the crisis the world is facing now. It's, you know what, it's for people to learn to where to find credible sources of information. So all those things about what employers can and cannot do, it's all posted publicly. Anyone can read it. It's on the government website. It's on the WHO website. You've got the ECDC. You've got the CDC. It's about understanding where to search for these credible sources of information and not to believe all the hype that Facebook is uh, and Twitter is sharing. Don't get me wrong, I love those platforms. It's about understanding what's right and what's wrong and, 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 and you learn from that, you okay. become more stealthy. Philip? Well, I think that you know, this disease appears to be particularly contagious but not particularly virulent. And with luck, it will leave us better prepared for what people really fear, which is a disease which is both contagious uh, and virulent. So with, with luck, it will help us save lives in the future. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate getting your thoughts today. I want to thank our guests, Philip Legrand, financial analyst and economist, Dr. Anthony Renshaw, and uh, also we have joining us from Wales over Skype. Thank you very much, Burton Paul. Thank you.
And thank you as well for watching. You can see the programme, of course, uh, again, anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And then for further discussion, there's always Facebook, Facebook page as well. That's uh, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And then, of course, you can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle AJ Inside Story. From me, Mariam Namazi, and the team here in London and in Doha, bye for now.